with Fort Valley, and we'd like to uh, welcome everyone here. We have two speakers uh, that will be talking about different relief programs. And up first, uh, I'll just give a brief introduction. It will be Brett Martin. Uh, Brett works for USDA FSA in the state office. They're located in Athens, Georgia, and he will be talking about uh, relief programs uh, through FSA. At this time, I will yield and let Brent give a brief overview of who he is and his shop, and we'll begin with his presentation. Brett. Hey, good morning. Um, I am Brett Martin. I'm with Farm Service Agency here in Athens, Georgia. I uh, hope everybody can hear me okay. Mark, you hear me good? Yes, I hear you good. Okay. All right. Just making sure. And I, and I do have a general presentation, a PowerPoint presentation I'll share with you for a moment. But today I'm going to talk about the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program. This is a new program that FSA will be implementing. I tell you, the information I have is very general information. In fact, while I was trying to log into this uh, Zoom meeting, the president did announce the program. So about 20 minutes ago, he announced that FSA will be starting the sign up for the program. That'll be sometime next week. And and later today, there should be more information coming from the USDA, and the information will be posted on the farmers.gov website. And, and that's a, uh, a departmental website. It, uh, it's kind of becoming our premier website for information that's available from the USDA. There is a, a coronavirus webpage within that site, and there is a CFAP, CFAP page on there as well. So that's what we turn the program, Coronavirus Food Assistance Program, CFAP is what you call it. I know that there's been a lot of organizations been putting out information about this program. However, kind of like they hold us pretty tight as being employees that, you know, we can't uh, release any information until it's official comes from our national office and says that we can release it. And really, I don't have a whole lot of information about the program at the moment. Uh, FSA employees, we will be trained later this week on the program. Of course, it'll be online training that employees will go through and hopefully the sign up will be starting next week. Uh, should be very, a very, uh, as they term it, a streamlined application process and application to complete so it should flow fairly easy and you know there again but holding integrity to the program so uh, it, it should not be a very cumbersome sign up for producers so uh, as i said later on this afternoon there should be more detailed information about the program but i'm going to pull up my um my presentation i have now as I said, I'm going to talk about uh, coronavirus food assistance program and a little background about this. This program comes out of what's called the CARES Act, the Coronavirus Relief and Economic Security Act. And this was signed into law by President Trump on March 27th of this year. Actually, what was allocated for the CARES Act was $48.9 billion for the Department of Agriculture and also for the Food and Drug Administration. And within that, there's uh, $9.5 billion available to ag producers impacted by the COVID-19 virus. Also, there was $14 billion allocated to uh, refresh the Commodity Credit Corporation funding. And Commodity Credit Corporation, this was a government entity that was set up, uh, well, decades ago to assist our uh, producers, farmers, and FSA pretty much handles most of CCC's funding. In fact, our uh, programs, they're, they're either funded by what we term federal uh, federal funds or CCC funds. So we do a lot with the CCC funding. And on April 17th of this year, Secretary Purdue announced uh, the CFAP program and within that program, there's $19 billion was allocated to it to help farmers, ranchers, and consumers through direct payments and also through the food box uh, distribution program. 
Now, FSA is going to be responsible for the direct payment portion of the program, and their $16 billion has been allocated to fund it. And then the USDA Agricultural Service, AMS, uh, they will be responsible for administering the food purchase and distribution program. And there's $3 billion allocated for it. And, and basically with that program, if you're not familiar with it, uh, the USDA is going to be providing uh, purchasing a variety of commodities from meat and produce and dairy. And then there have been uh, federal contractors that have been hired, like companies, organizations. They will actually take these purchased products and they'll take them in and they'll box them in with uh, different commodities within that box. They'll box them, palletize them, and ship them to food banks. Food banks will be able to distribute to people that, you know, that uh, is in need of the food. Actually, they term it as a, a uh, truck to trunk program where it's just very easy. Food bank just has to take it right off the pallet and put it in somebody's vehicle. So the CFAP direct payments, they'll provide direct support uh, based on losses for agricultural producers where the prices have been basically depressed and any market supply chains have been impacted. Uh, CFAP will assist producers with additional adjustments for marketing and marketing costs resulting from lost demand and short-term oversupply caused by the COVID-19. And, and also the USDA will be looking at the time period of January of this year through April of this year is the time frame for the immediate assistance for the direct payment. And then USD will also be monitoring for the next uh, few months about the situation and still seeing if uh, the prices are being depressed and, and the uh, marketing change are being disrupted there again because of the COVID-19 virus. And the program is open to all producers regardless of the size and market outlet as long as they suffered an eligible loss. And the disruption to the markets and demand, you know, USDA realizes it's significant and what payments we do make will only uh, provide, you know, relief to producers. It won't make them whole as they term it, but it will provide them some type of financial uh, support. And just talk a little bit about preparing for CFAP. Well, CFAP's here now. Uh, like I said, as of probably about 30 minutes ago when the president announced it. But our FSA county offices, you know, we've been disrupted because of the COVID-19 situation. So our offices, we have approximately 60 county offices in the state of Georgia. Uh, some offices may take care of one county. Some may have up to 10 counties that they're responsible for uh, services in those counties. And I will say that FSA County offices were not closed. We're still opening, but we are prevented from having visitors come into our offices or our USDA service centers at this time. I, I don't know when offices will be back to where they can uh, have visitors, farmers come in and visit the office in person. But we're still carrying on with our sign -up, program sign up. Uh, such as our ARC PLC and now CFAP will be going on. Also, we're taking acreage reports and providing any other assistance uh, that producers need. Uh, basically, what we're using, utilizing telephone, making telephone appointments for people where uh, the county office can call them, spend a little time with them on the phone, uh, asking questions, help assisting them with sign up. Also using email, fax, and online tools. We don't have Zoom, but we have what's called Teams. It's a Microsoft product that we use primarily. Uh, that may be used. I've heard of some offices have been using FaceTime, anything that they can uh, use to communicate with producers remotely. So uh, Existing FSA producers, what you can do is ensure your contact information is up to date. Also, you, what's determined as your eligibility information is current. 
Uh, most of our programs, you have to do an adjusted gross income form. That has to be done yearly. Make sure that you have yours updated uh, for 2020 because it will be used for this program for CFAP. Uh, any new producers, like I said, this is looking at might be a lot, uh, lot more producers. We expect heavy sign up for this program. So there may be some smaller producers or producers that's never really been aware of FSA and never participated with them that will come in. So there, there's quite a few forms you have to do to establish yourself with FSA. So that's what we term as the eligibility forms. So you need to complete those forms to be registered with FSA. And the basic information that will be needed, of course, your contact information, name, address, your tax identification number, you know, whether you're farming as an individual with social security number or if you have a employer's identification number, if you have, if you're operating under like a limited liability company or if you're uh, doing a general partnership such as that, whatever uh, required tax identification number for your farming operation, FSA will need that. And also your farming operation structure as I mentioned, whether you're individual or you're an entity or partnership. Also, adjusted gross income information uh, to ensure eligibility on that. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in another slide or two. And then a direct deposit uh, form you would need to complete. And this basic information, like I said, our county offices are open. You need to you know, pick up your telephone, call them, talk to them when you can update that information. If you're already an existing producer, if you're a new producer, talk with them when you can complete that required paperwork. And some of the things you can be doing now, uh, farmers can be, is compiling your farm sales records and your inventory records for the time period of January through April of this year. Have them handy for the program sign up. And as I mentioned, this is going to be a, a streamlined process of so the application should be fairly easy to complete. And with this uh, program, it will not require an acreage report like most of our programs do. But when I talk to producer groups, I, I tell them it's in their benefit to normally file an acreage report with FSA, whether you're participating in a program at the time or not, because who knows what the future holds. Now, I'll give you an example. Uh, FSA just finished uh, the sign up payments for the 2019 marketing facilitation program, and that was a newly created program because of the uh, tariff situation uh, that's ongoing with the uh, 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 with um, the U.S. trade with China and with that program for 2019 and Africa had to have a 2018 or 2019 acreage report to be eligible for payment. Well, you know, this was occurring in 2019. Most everybody can file an acreage report during that year and be good. However, a lot of times for 2018 for a lot of the commodities, it was too late to file an acreage report. And those producers were not eligible. Uh, they could sign up for the program, but they couldn't get paid for the program if they didn't have an acreage report for 18 and 19. So, you know, some producers, as you term it, left a lot of money on the table because they didn't have an acreage report. So I encourage producers to always file an acreage report with FSA. It does not cost any money if you timely file an acreage report now, different uh, crops have different deadlines. If you're signed up with our state office newsletter, you get what's called a gov delivery bulletin. You get an email every month with the Georgia FSA state office newsletter. And we do have the most current uh, acreage reporting deadlines in that newsletter. All right. As I mentioned, I was going to say uh, Secretary Purdue will now start to sign up. Actually, it was the president that announced it earlier today, along with Secretary Purdue. And there should be a uh, press release from Secretary Purdue's office coming out 
uh, maybe this afternoon or tomorrow that we'll have more information about the program in it. And some of the required forms for the program, of course, if you're brand new uh, producer, you complete an AD2047. Uh, this is just a uh, customer data worksheet. It's just getting your general information, name, address, tax identification number, and a few more things. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the adjusted gross income requirements uh, will apply to this program. So you have to fill out what's called a CCC 941, Average Adjusted Gross Income Certification and Consent Form. Uh, you will do, need to do one for 2020. And this is look, looking at uh, a person or a legal entity, ever how you operate, cannot exceed a $900,000 average AGI. And that's looking at a three year time period. So the way it works, we're in 2020 right now. So it would skip the preceding tax year of 2019 because actually you're doing your, uh, some people have not completed their tax returns for 2019. So AGI would go look back at the year 18 uh, 17 and 16. So the average of those years, if you exceed 900,000, uh, you would not be eligible for the program. However, if you can certify that 75% uh, or more of your income comes from farming, ranching, or forestry, then you could be eligible for uh, the payment or higher payment limit. And that's a CCC 942 form on which you would do that. Uh, as I mentioned, direct deposit form, you need to complete one of those. We do encourage everybody to do direct deposit. There are some situations, uh, uh, barring it, some type hard hardship situation where you say, hey, I want to get a paper check. Uh, you can do that, but you would need to make that known to the county office, but we pretty much direct everybody to do a direct deposit uh, paper checks. They usually come a little bit later than a direct deposit. Uh, direct deposit more secure. I tell you right now, uh, having to deal with a situation where someone stole some of our paper checks that that was issued, and you know we're trying to work hard with our Office of Inspector General and the Treasury Department. They're having to investigate it. So some of these producers, and they're six months out and still had not got their uh, program paper. But as I said, it's under an investigation. But if you do direct deposit, it's more secure. You get your program payments quicker. So, and also uh, another form would be a CCC 902. That's a farm operating plan. This will tell us for this program for CFAP. Basically, we need your name, address, tax identification number. And it is going to look at some foreign person rules under this. So your citizenship status and any contribution of foreign persons involved in operation. And another form, not everyone has to complete, but if you do have, well, let's say if uh, entities or members of an operation, then a CCC 901 would need to be completed. It's kind of like a 902. But for uh, legal entities and joint ventures, that would just list the actual people that is a member of that entity or joint venture. And the last form is a AD 1026 to highly erodible land and wetland conservation form. This is just basically asking you if you're going to uh, do any farming on highly erodible land or wetlands, and if you are, making sure that there's actually been a some type of conservation plan that has been completed by the uh, Natural Resource and Conservation Service, NRCS, one of our uh, uh, co-agencies, as long as that's been done so it will not, you know, detrimentally impact any highly erodible land or wetland. So. And as I mentioned, as far as information coming out, your best source of information will be farmers.gov. This is just a screenshot of the CFAP page that's currently up on the website. 
you can just go to your browser and type in farmers.gov and you'll be able to pull up the website and that there should be some more information uh, updated or current information updated sometime this afternoon, at least by tomorrow on the program. And as, as the week goes on, there'll be more information coming out about the program. So, and that's my uh, presentation about CFAP. Like I said, it's just general information. I don't have any detailed information at this time, but th that will be coming out uh, this afternoon, later on this week. So, has anyone got any questions? Take a few questions. Does anybody have any questions for Brett before we move on to Peter? We got a couple of minutes. Brett, I had the, all those forms you mentioned. If I don't have access to one of those forms, can I call the local county office and they can either fax, mail, or email me that, or is it available yeah. online? Yeah. Uh, they should be available online. Uh, Farmers.gov may have a link to them. We also have a FSA.gov website and FSA on the FSA website. I know most of these forms are listed, but you know, you can call the county office and they, they'll assist you. They can email you these forms. That would be no problem. Brett. Titus Andrews, County Age of in Lawrence County. Do you mind we have a co copy of your uh, presentation? Uh, yes, I, I can send a copy. You, you want me to, Mark, you want me to send it it's to send you? Send it to Mark, yes. Yeah, or, if you uh, send it to me, I'll disseminate it. Yes, that's fine. Okay, okay. Thank and you. Like I said, this, this is just very generalized. I took this out of some uh, talking points. And also there's a program notice that FSA issued and also our notices and handbooks, they're listed on the FSA.gov website. So uh, that's what I took my information out of, but more detailed information is just, I'm going to say coming, <laughs> coming out any moment because things are moving quickly now. And, you know, when this sign up hits, it, it, it's going to go, I'm going to say go fast. And the intentions are to get folks signed up and after they get signed up to try and get their payment out as soon as possible. Uh, Britt, another quick question for you. Do you anticipate you all having, once you all kind of, I know you said you all got to go through a training, but once you all kind of gone through a training, do you anticipate uh, a few more outreach meetings to like venues like this with Zoom where you all will be publicizing this program and make sure everybody... Um, or how do you envision that, or have you all had some communications on that? I do know that they have some outreach, uh, public affairs packages put together that our national office will be sending out. Uh, last week, there was a joint um, joint Zoom meeting with um, FSA and AMS about the CFAP program. Our uh, deputy administrator for farm programs, Mr. Bill Beam, he presented some, probably about like I did. I haven't seen it. I was unable to get on there due to the limited amount of spaces that were available for the program. But it's posted on the FSA.gov website, and it has some general information about the program. Okay. All right. Thank you. So, Hey Mark, we have a lot of couple of people on the phone. Um, I can unmute everybody if case if we can still open for questions. Yep, if you uh, would go ahead. Right, anybody, anybody on the phone? Happy yes, my name is Tiffany Wright, and I got on a little late, and I was wondering if I could get a copy of the presentation as well. Uh, yes. Yeah, uh, Miss Wright, did you pre-register where we have your name and email address? No, sir, I did not. Okay, I'll tell you what. I'm going to give you my phone number, and you take this phone number down, and you give me a phone or text me your uh, email address, and I will make sure I get it to you. My number is 478 Okay. And your name again? Mark Thomas, if you text me uh, your email address, I'll make sure you get a copy of the PowerPoint. 
Okay, your number again was 478-235-5438. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. What county are you in? Lawrence County. Are there any other questions? Do you have any other questions? I I have a question. This is Myrna. That um, eligible the list of eligible losses is that something that we would get from the website or from Titus? Uh, uh, yes, yes. The commodities that are eligible and the requirements they should they will be on the farmers.gov website. I said uh, a few on earlier. The president just announced it probably around 11:40 today, and information will be posted to farmers.gov website. Be some information posted this afternoon. Marna, I'll make sure we all get that list. All right, thank you. And, and Titus, just to confirm, Tiffany's father is one of your clients. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? And up next, we have Peter Williams um, from University of Georgia Small Business Administration, and he'll be talking about various different uh, programs that they have in which some of those programs farmers are eligible for. And I'll let Peter give a brief introduction of him, and he will go into his presentation. And you have the same option for those of you that are with us through Zoom. Uh, if you have a question, you are eligible to put that question in your chat box and we will read that question off as we get them. Uh, but also, we will have some questions at the end. All right, with that being said, Peter, the floor is now yours. All right, well, thank you. And, and uh, are you able to see my, yes. my PowerPoint? Yes, we are. Okay, good. Um, well, thank you for including me. I'm, I'm happy to be here and happy to uh, virtually be with you and, and uh, meet all of you. Uh, my name's Peter Williams, and I am a business consultant with the University of Georgia Small Business Development Center. And what I've been asked to talk about today is um, the, the uh, set of programs that are available from the Small Business Administration uh, under sort of the CARES Act the, and, and give you an emergency loan overview of those programs. Um, they've been in the news a lot, which is, which is kind of different for, for, for me uh, lately in the last couple of months to see some of the things that I have been working on uh, and, and have been a part of to be uh, to be discussed in the national news and in the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Um, so that's kind of interesting in, in, a, in a strange way. But, but the major programs um, that, that you may have heard about too uh, through, through those same news stories are uh, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, uh, or IDLE, the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, which you'll see in the headlines as the PPP um, and the Emergency Bridge Loan Program or the EBL. Uh, and I haven't heard a lot about that one, uh, but uh, let's, let's dive in. Uh, to, to give you a little bit of background on who is the Small Business Development Center, um, we are part of the University of Georgia and where we fit into the university is in what's called um, the the uh, Public Service and Outreach Division. And uh, the, the SBDC, or the Small Business Development Center, has been around now for, I think, 42 years. Um, and our mission is to provide educational support and resources to Georgia uh, small businesses and, and aspiring entrepreneurs. And 
the Georgia map that you see on your screen right now um, sort of uh, reflects our public service mission. Uh, we are available physically under ordinary circumstances to um, citizens all over the state. Uh, the, the map has 17 stars on it. Golly, I hope, I hope that's right. Uh, but uh, th those represent all of our offices around the state. Um, and so uh, just about everybody in the state can have a reasonable drive, uh, not, not too long, uh, to, to get to one of our offices and meet with one of our, one of our business consultants. Um, so let's go ahead and dive in. Um, the, the disaster programs most relevant uh, for the small business owner, and, and uh, this is from an SBA perspective, the first one uh, is the guaranteed loan uh, payment relief uh, proviso. Uh, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, or EIDL, uh, and its cousin, the EIDL Advance, uh, the Paycheck Protection Program, and the Emergency Bridge Loan. Um, the, the Guaranteed Loan Payment Relief um, is the one uh, part of this CARES Act that nobody's talking about. Um, and, and I even talked with somebody today, this morning, um, who is in the process of getting an SBA loan, a, a, a more a customary, not a disaster loan, a, a normal SBA loan. He's acquiring a, a building that he's going to start a business in. And um, he hadn't heard of this. Uh, and and uh, it's, it's kind of amazing because of how important this is. Uh, and in fact, a lot of a lot of banks have not heard of it, which is which is another puzzler. Uh, but but this uh, proviso says that the SBA will actually pay the principal interest and any associated fees owed on any SBA guaranteed loans for six months, as follows: uh, for an existing borrower, if you got an SBA loan five years ago and it's due 12 years from now, um, and the loan is not on deferment, beginning with the next payment due on the loan, uh, the SBA will make your payments for six months. If you uh, are an existing borrower and your loan is already, you've already received a deferment, then once that deferment period is over, then the SBA will make your next six payments. And this is, uh, one that I've been letting a lot of people know about who are in the process of maybe starting a business with a, with a new SBA loan. Uh, even for new borrowers, um, uh, the, the date now is, is firm. Uh, within six months, uh, it, it's uh, loans taken, closed by September 27th, 2020. Uh, if you get an SBA loan, uh, that's not one of these disaster loans that I'm uh, going to talk about uh, shortly. Um, you don't have to make the first six payments uh, if the loan closes by September 20th. Uh, the SBA actually will make uh, those payments, and, and this is not a deferral. Uh, that's, that's not what this is. It's actually the SBA making the payments. Um, I, I like to... Um, my colorful name for this is it's, it's a ghost equity investor. It's money directly in your pocket that you don't have to pay back. You don't have a new partner. Uh, it's just six months of payments uh, made on your behalf. So it's, a, it's an unbelievable program. And you don't have to apply. It's automatic. Um, okay, so let's get into the ones that you, you probably have heard something more about. Uh, and uh, the first one uh, is the, the IDLE or the Economic Injury Disaster Loan program. One big difference about the, the IDLE program by comparison to other SBA programs is that the lender in this program is actually, is actually the SBA. Uh, most traditional SBA uh, lending programs are actually SBA guarantee programs where the SBA will guarantee a payment or, or 
substantial amounts of the payment uh, on, on bank loans, on loans that are made by traditional lenders. But this is a, a direct loan program from the SBA. Um, and this program actually pre, predated uh, the CARES Act. Um, the, the SBA has been in the disaster lending business for many, many years. Uh, but most of those uh, disasters have not been economic injuries. They're, they're, you know, hurricanes or tornadoes or floods or things like that. Um, this one uh, is an economic injury disaster loan and uh, working with uh, Governor Kemp, uh, I had a, maybe I'm saying that backwards. Governor Kemp asked us uh, at the SBDC to help him identify businesses in Georgia, and this was sometime along mid-March, um, at least one business in every county in Georgia uh, to bolster his request that Georgia be considered, uh, be declared an economic uh, uh, injury disaster uh, eligible location, and that, that took place in March. Um, so uh, small businesses uh, with 500 employees or fewer are eligible to apply for this loan. Um, and this particular proviso uh, is, there's a couple things in this that are out of date. Um, as time has gone by with this program, um, it was recognized that uh, if, if uh, that they needed to make the maximum loan size smaller in order to make more people eligible. Um, and so uh, the eligibility now for, for this loan is capped at 150,000. So it's a far cry from 2 million. Um, loans are made based on credit scores, personal credit scores. Uh, the interest rate is 375, fixed rate uh, for, uh, for 30 years. Um, and the first 12 payments are uh, deferred. And this is not a, they're still owed. They just are deferred, um, but uh, so you don't have to make uh, any payments for the first 12 months. And they're 30 year fixed rate loans, which is really something, something else. Um, okay, uh, I kind of skipped over one thing, but I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, and then the, the, the part of the idol that was specifically implemented under uh, under the CARES Act, uh, which passed in late March, was the, the idle advance. And this is one that a whole lot of people have heard about. We've had hundreds of calls to our office uh, asking just specifically about the advance, not even about the, the loan programs. Um, for those that apply to the idle, uh, for, for the idle loan, um, an advance of up to um, and it's a, two little words, up to $10,000 uh, is, is uh, uh, possible, uh, may be provided. And it's uh, calculated as $1,000 per employee. Um, the advance uh, does not need to be repaid um, even if the IDA loan uh, is, is denied, if the borrower is denied the loan, or if the borrower themselves gets approved for the loan and decides, I don't want to take it. So the $10,000 uh, is an advance that doesn't need to be paid back. Um, and then uh, this is what I skipped over on the loan uh, itself, uh, but it's true for both the advance and the loan. Uh, the the uh, idle money is supposed to be used for, for working capital. Um, somewhat broadly defined, but, but not terribly broadly. Uh, you can use it to maintain payroll, to pay uh, sick leave, um, to uh, meet increased production costs that, that may be resulting from the uh, economic conditions, uh, and then pay uh, interest on debt, uh, interest on mortgages, and, and rent. Um, and the government will be checking uh, on how you've used this money. We don't know uh, what the protocols and procedures for, for those uh, uh, for that will be, but um, 
we're telling all of our clients who, who receive these loans, uh, compliance is going to be important and we're recommending that you uh, set up a separate dedicated bank account for uh, just uh, ins and outs for, for your idle money. Make it real easy to track and, and easy to verify that you're using the money for the, uh, for the allowable purposes. Um, the idle loan, uh, another update recently is that um, the idle loan now at the moment uh, is available only to agricultural businesses. Uh, you can go to the idle uh, application. It's an online application um, and you can apply um, and you can kind of cruise through. Uh, it's like eight um, web pages that you go through in sequence and fill in information. None of it is terribly complicated information. Uh, it's not uploading tax returns or anything like that. Uh, 95 or more percent of the information that's asked for uh, you'll, you'll know by heart without even having to go look it up. It takes about 15, 20 minutes. Um, the last page of the application, is, there's a box you check to be considered uh, for, the, for the advance. I don't know why anybody would not check that box. Um, but what I was getting ready to say is the first page uh, asks you what line of business you're in. And they have not blocked people. You could uh, be a widget manufacturer and you could still go in and uh, fill out the application. They don't like block you on page one for being in the non-agricultural industry, but, uh, but they're not processing any applications. Uh, they're not taking any new applications at the moment other than uh, ag businesses. Um, okay, so the next um, thing, and this has gotten a whole lot of news, uh, a whole lot of publicity, uh, is the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, and um, the Paycheck Protection Program is, a, is an SBA guarantee program, back to kind of more traditional SBA lending, uh, that is a guaranteed program. Uh, it's, an, it's a loan guarantee program. So the bank is the lender and the SBA is the guarantor. And um, this uh, was specifically started uh, from scratch uh, by the CARES Act. And the CARES Act passed on March 27th. And uh, in the CARES Act, the language said, here's the program, here's the broad purposes of it. SBA and Treasury, you go implement it and you've got 30 days to make this available and have all the protocols and procedures ready to go. And um, the SBA and Treasury um, had everything ready to go by April 2nd. So they, they had it done in six days. Um, and uh, as is understandable with a new program, um, there's been some confusion and there's been sort of a rolling set of clarifications that have been made um, as we've gone along. Um, in, uh, I want to say late April, uh, both the IDLE program and the PPP uh, ran out of money and Congress reauthorized uh, another uh, round of funding. And at the moment, they're both, uh, they, they, neither has run out of money again. Uh, so the PPP, the way it works uh, is uh, they're two-year loans uh, with a fixed rate, uh, interest rate of uh, 1%. And to be eligible, again, you got to be a small business um, as defined by SBA size standards. Uh, and you can see uh, that's a pretty big, small business, some of these uh, higher limits there, at least by my standards. Um, and then uh, it's, it's been made uh, streamlined. Uh, there's, there's not a no credit elsewhere test. Uh, there's no personal guarantee or collateral required, which is a very important feature. Uh, the borrower will pay no fees at all uh, for these loans. 
no application fee, no nothing. Uh, the size of the loans can be up to 10 million. Uh, one of the things that uh, SBA has recently announced is that they're actually going to they're going to go back and check uh, every loan that um, is part of this program that's greater than $2 million. They just want to make sure that, that it really is small businesses uh, getting these loans and, and uh, following, following all the rules. Um, but the loan amount is based on recent payroll costs. And essentially what that means is the, the, the loan amount is 2.5 times the business's average monthly payroll. Uh, so 2.5 times the, the business's average monthly payroll. Um, and the whole point of this thing is, is to um, protect people's paychecks, uh, enable small businesses to keep their, uh, their team together. Uh, and so uh, the business uh, has to certify as part of the application that they'll use the loan to retain workers, maintain payroll, uh, make uh, mortgage interest payments or lease payments uh, and to pay utilities. So it's a very circumscribed list of allowable purposes. And then this is uh, the thing that really, really gives this program its punch. Uh, the loans can actually be forgiven. Uh, you don't have to pay them back as a borrower if uh, during the eight weeks period uh, starting from uh, the day you receive the funds, um, you spend the money on eligible costs, uh, which are as noted. So if you spend your entire PPP loan during this 56 days on uh, payroll, mortgage interest, rent, and utilities, you don't have to pay a dime. You don't have to pay it back. Uh, the SBA will, will pay the bank back uh, on your behalf. Uh, compensation annualized uh, in excess of $100,000 annually uh, would be excluded, wouldn't qualify. Uh, and then uh, at least 75% of your spending um, has to be made up of payroll costs. Okay. Um, and then the last uh, element uh, of uh, the, the emergency loan package, you might say, uh, is this emergency bridge loan. And to be honest with you, I haven't had, uh, this is really a loan of last resort, and I have not, uh, I haven't worked with anybody, uh, any client who has sought this. Uh, the lender uh, has to be uh, an SBA express approved lender, which is fine. Also, the borrower has to have a current relationship with that lender. So this is gonna be available to a pretty narrow group. Uh, the maximum loan amount is 25,000. Fees are permitted to be charged to the borrower. Uh, the guarantee is only 50% of the loan. Um, and uh, proceeds uh, are to be used to, to reopen or for the ongoing survival of the small business. Uh, collateral is not required. However, a personal guarantee may be required. And the loan is not forgivable. Um, now, um, <clears throat> the next several slides um, are sort of extracts from a document that um, our organization prepared. Uh, we, we sort of had a couple people, I don't know how they got assigned this, if they held their hands up or if somebody tapped them on the shoulder, but we, had a, uh, we have a, a group within our organization and we've got about 50 consultants around the state, um, but uh, we have uh, about three who are paying special attention uh, to keeping the rest of us um, apprised and updated and, and in the know about these programs. And they put together a three-page, uh, four-page PDF that includes a comparison grid of these programs, feature by feature. Uh, and this is one page, uh, this, this 
PowerPoint is one ex extract from that. Uh, and that's another one uh, and another. Um, you're welcome to have my slides. Uh, you're welcome to have a copy of the PDF, though it would it would it just replicates what's in what's in the slides. Um, and we're kind of proud to say that once we published that, and that was in um, kind of mid-April, um, several other states um, SBDCs. There's there's at least one SBDC in every state in the in the union. Um, Se several other states um, produced a, 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 a document that was eerily similar, uh, with the only difference being that their logo was on it instead of ours. Uh, so uh, we figured we were doing something right. Uh, but that's available. Uh, you can you can have the slides, um, and and uh, hopefully this has been informative. Um, for additional assistance um, on these types of things, um, you can contact me. I'd be happy to uh, help you myself or point you in the right direction. Uh, we do offer one-on-one uh, -on -one confidential consulting uh, with uh, small businesses uh, that we offer by appointment and at no cost. At the moment, we're doing uh, all of our consulting um, remote by, by some kind of remote tools, either telephone or Zoom uh, like, like this. Uh, but we're working with a lot of people. Um, I've helped about 40, uh, 40 small businesses obtain loans under these programs uh, for, for in amounts, you know, for several million dollars uh, total. Um, and so um, I'd be happy to help uh, we and as I say, we have colleagues. I have colleagues all over the state. So, feel free to email me. Uh, my email address is p as in Peter uh, w i l l i a m s at Georgia S B D C, and that's Georgia written out uh, g e o r g i a s b d c dot o r g. Um, and, and I'm going to kind of skip through this. I want to get to the contact information. Uh, well, that's, that's uh, our website. So you can, you can find me there as well, uh, georgiasbdc.org. Um, and then uh, those are the emails for a couple of our offices. But substitute my name, P. Williams, at georgiasbdc.org. So if you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them now. Uh, or uh, if you want to approach me uh, separately and set up a phone call, I'd be happy to do that too. Peter. Sir. Tigers Andrews, question for you. Sure. On the payroll protection, if you have a church with a nonprofit organization, which is a nonprofit organization, and they have daycares and they hire empl have employees, would this qualify for them also? Yes. Yes, it Thank would. You. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, it sure would. And that's an exception uh, that I, I should have noted. Uh, that, that's an uh, unusual feature for this program by comparison to typical SBA lending programs. They, they typically need to work uh, need to lend to for-profit entities, but but uh, not for the PPP. Peter, this is Stefan Price. Have you had any small daycare business owners uh, applying for the payroll protection program uh, funds? Um, well, I personally have not uh, not assisted any any uh, any daycare owners. Um, and I'm not, I, I, well, I will say I, I can, I'm not speaking for the SBA, but I can almost guarantee that, that they have. Um, I'm, and, and I'm confident that I've had colleagues that have helped uh, those kinds of businesses, but I, I haven't personally. Uh, uh, Philip yeah. Petway has his hand raised. Okay. Peter, uh, Philip Petway, Fort Valley State. Um, 
you mentioned there that when you got to talking about the PPP payment protection, there was no application fee. Is there an application fee on the idle loan? Nope. No, there's, there's no fees at all. Um, one of the things that's um, received comment, let's, let's say it that way, is the banks aren't making a lot of money on these, <laughs> these things either. Um, the, 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 they are making a fee, uh, a processing fee, uh, but it, it's paid by, um, by the SBA. Yes. A I've, had, um, I've had two business, private business owners say that they have applied. Um, one builds fences, um, a fence company. The other one does 1099, um, actually spraying um, electrostatic for this COVID-19 type stuff. Wow. They told me they've applied, but uh, for the, you know, for the loans in, in this category, but they, you know, didn't get approved. Uh, I think they tried to say because they were still able to make payroll, yada, yada, yada. But I, I still, I felt like it might've been something else that they didn't, that, you know, that they got turned down for. Just, yeah. You know, I, yeah. I'd be interested in, uh, I'd be interested in seeing if I could help. Um, there, there really is not supposed to be a, uh, a need test for this. Uh, if, if, if I understood you correctly, uh, the, the lender is really not supposed to look at it and say, well, you don't need the money. Um, uh, the, the borrower certifies, it's actually a borrower certification that the bank uh, is, is allowed to rely on. Uh -huh. uh, that the borrower thinks that basically the borrower thinks they need it based on current business conditions. Um, so um, that, yeah, that would be my only thought on that, but yeah, I'd be happy to see if, if I could help. Um, the other thing I was just going to mention um, one, one little uh, uh, thing that's been helpful to, to people uh, is when they apply for the idle loan, you know, they don't have a banker to call, right? Uh, that's what's kind of nice about the PPP is you can call the bank and presumably get an answer. But for the idle application, you know, you're, you're trying to get somebody on the phone at the SBA and they're getting, you know, they're just, they're just not set up to give individual answers about your loan application status. So one thing that we've found to be <laughs> kind of an interesting workaround. Uh, the idol is especially, uh, especially emphasizes your personal credit score in terms of the approval and the, the application process. So if you actually, you, you apply, you get a confirmation that you applied. If you call uh, the credit reporting agency, uh, Equifax, Experian, and, and TransUnion, um, I'm not sure which one uh, the SBA is using uh, or if they're using a little bit of all of them. But if you call and, and just ask about your own report and say, has there been any hard credit pulls on my report, uh, they'll be able to tell you if there has been and if it was by the SBA. And if it was by the SBA, that tells you your loan is in process. Uh, and, and I've had several people call me who were, you know, who were clients and say, gee, I haven't heard anything. I've tried the SBA. They're not telling me anything. And uh, I've suggested that workaround and they call and they're like, oh, cool. They checked. And a few days later, they've, they've gotten notified that they got the loan. So um, I just throw that out there too, as a, a, a kind of a nice workaround that some of my colleagues discovered and we're all telling our clients about. Could you, last question. And I don't know if you can or not. Could you share maybe one or two examples of small ag related, ag production, ag related producer um, loan applications or idle applications that might be out there or PPP? Um, I can't think of any right offhand. Uh, Peter, this is Stefan Price. Um, I can I can vouch for the the idle advances. Uh, I've had some producers that have told me that they have uh, applied for the idle advances. And when you said it's a streamlined process, when they put the application in online within one or two days, they had the money in their bank accounts. 
Wow. Okay. That's the advance, right? Yes, on the advance. Yes. Wow, that's that's what they were talking about doing, you know, the whole time. And uh, I think in the weeks following the passage of the CARES Act, it just there was just so much volume that that they they just weren't able to do it as fast as they wanted to. And it seems like as they've worked through that volume, they're they're back to you know, hitting, hitting some of those timelines that they always wanted to, but one or two days, that's, that's great news. Are there any questions from the callers? Do these programs still have funds or have they all been exhausted? They've still got funds. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, that's been something to keep an eye on. With the farming program, it talks about being a business entity. Do you have to have be set up as an LLC or could you be an individual farming operation? Um, you can be an individual. You don't have to be set up as an LLC. I see my, my contact information in the chat box. So that's good. So if, if anybody uh, thinks of questions later, uh, go ahead and take a chat box and uh, do, copy it to your clipboard and save it somewhere. Uh, that's that's all of my content information and I'd be uh, delighted to hear from you. Well, if, if there's uh, nothing else, uh, Mark, I've, I've got uh, something uh, else on my calendar in a few minutes here. Um, Hey, um, this is Brad. If I could just mention one thing before we close it out. I, I just checked the farmers.gov website is updated with a lot of CFAP information about their direct payments. Also about AMS's program. Uh, it has a list of the eligible commodities, whether it's row crops, specialty crops, livestock, uh, dairy. Uh, there also is a list of those forms that I went over so, uh, it, it, you know, I'd say go there and check the uh, farmers.gov website. Like I said, there's a wealth of information that was just put on there. So, thank you. Thank you, Brett. So, Titus, if you or, or um, Leon would want to close us out, we'd like to thank everybody. But if one of y'all will close us out. Okay. I will. Thank you for all those that participated on our Ag Update uh, Zoom meeting. If you need us, please feel free to contact us. Thank you and enjoy the rest of y'all day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.